Joseph, we are continuing our series on the life of Joseph. And I have some good news. I was reviewing my sermon last night and I felt like it was too long and I cut it into two. So if we're going to do half and half, I need you guys to all come back next week for part two. So this is going to be the, the shortened version as long as you agree to come back next week. You agree to come back next week? Okay, so I'll, I'll start half now and then the second half next week. But we're continuing in the story of Joseph. We are in uh, Genesis chapter 39 and we'll be covering um, the, the first few verses here. So I hope you are there with me. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads for prayer one more time. Father in heaven, we're so excited to come together to, to worship. Lord, you got to witness baptism. Lord, people receiving the free gift of salvation, having their sins washed away, being born again to a new walk with you. And, and Lord, as we come together and as we worship you for who you are, as we open the Bible to study it, speak to our hearts. Teach us the lessons that you'd have us learn from this story. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As usual, I have a blog post on this with more notes and details, which allows me to sort of summarize here as I go with you, and we can always go deeper later on my blog. It's free. It's prmarlin.com, and there's a QR code that many of you already know where it is. Um, there's a quote that I really like about this portion of Joseph's stories. It says, the Lord ensured that Joseph's trials would rebound or redound to the good of others. This is encouraging for me because when I face trials in life, I, I take solace in stories like the story of Joseph that my struggle and my pain and my suffering does not have to go to waste. God can use the hardships that I face to bless people around me. And we're going to see this eventually in the story of Joseph, but we start to see that in um, to this morning's passage. Genesis chapter 39. I, ho I hope you have your Bibles with you. I want you to have that habit of bringing it with you, opening it, and following along, whether it's digital or physical. It's good to hold the preacher accountable and make sure that whatever I'm sharing is actually found in the Bible. That's right, right? It's a good thing. So remember last time I preached, we talked about this whole thing of going down and how Judah had gone down from his brothers. Some translations will, will be a little bit more accurate. That's what it says there in Genesis chapter, there we go, Genesis chapter 38, verse 1, when we talked about Judah and Tamar. But really the idea here of Joseph going down in Genesis 39, verse 1 says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So the big difference between Judah and Joseph is that the text here references this. It's almost redundant. It says that Joseph had been taken down, Genesis 39, verse 1. And then it says how he was bought from the Ishmaelites who brought him. Uh, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of the Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So Joseph was taken down and it's repeated. He was not going to Egypt by choice. He was sold by his brothers. He was taken down. He was bought by somebody else. Where Judah chose to come down. And this also ties the story in back to Genesis 37, where the chapter ends telling us that Joseph had been sold in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. So now we continue the story. We pick up the story of Joseph. But this whole idea of going down, one of the commentaries pointed this out. It's really interesting. There's three descents or going downs that take place in the life of Joseph. Joseph's first descent took place when his brothers lowered him into uh, the pit. I, my sentence structure is awkward there. I'm sorry. And then the second one took place when... Here you go. His second descent is when he was, was his forced descent into the pit. And then the third descent... Actually, you're going to have to come back next week because when I was doing this slide, it was the full sermon, and now it's half. So the third descent is more symbolic, and that would take place later on in this same chapter. 
So we have a young man who God gave a vision of success in leadership. But in the practical life, he's only been going down. People around him, his brothers, his family lowered him and then he goes down to Egypt. So there's this theme and it's not a good one. It's at some point Joseph has to hit rock bottom. And it's odd to see this for a young man that supposedly God is blessing. And that supposedly God is with him. And we're going to get to that here in Genesis chapter 39 verse 2. And if you read that with me, if you follow along in your Bible, it says, The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of whom? His master, the Egyptian. Interesting sentence structure, right? So Joseph is successful. The Lord is with him. Well, what kind of success are we talking about? Well, he's successful for a slave in a foreign country. Uh, does that feel like success? And, you know, this is the thing that, that got me thinking. If we were in Joseph's situation, should we find ourselves as somebody else's slave in a foreign country, would we feel like the Lord is with us? And this got me thinking. Does my feeling whether or not God is with me represent the reality of whether or not God is with me? You know, we've been talking about feelings and emotions and the nervous system and how all that works for our mental health seminars. If you want to learn more, come tonight. But there's this interesting things that happen within our body. And, you know, the, our body reacts to things in different ways. And here we have something that's theologically true. The Lord was with Joseph. But emotionally, I wonder how aware he was of that. And when those two don't connect, what do we do? How do we handle that? If you were in Joseph's situation, how would you react? I, I was thinking about this, and I thought about, about another character in the Bible, Gideon. Gideon received a message that was similar. Here, nobody's talking to Joseph. The narrator simply tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. But in Judges chapter 6, verse 13, an angel of the Lord, or the angel of the Lord, and there's a whole thing you can do on that, studying just who the angel of the Lord is. We're not going to go there right now. But... In Judges 6, 13, the angel shows up and says to Gideon, The Lord is with you, mighty men of valor. Actually, that's in chapter, verse 12. So in verse 13, Gideon replies. God, an angel shows up and says, Gideon, the Lord is with you. This is fact. And Gideon says, oh yeah? Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. How often do we feel that way? Well, if the Lord is with me, how come I'm struggling so much to find work? If the Lord is with me, why did my car break down? If the Lord is with me, why is school so hard? If the Lord is with me, how come I can't fill in the blank? Why is my loved one sick? Why am I sick? Why are things so hard? So this is a, a normal response to this affirmation, to this idea that the Lord is with me. So we're going to go down a rabbit trail here for a little bit, and, and we'll come back. And, and here is the question that I have. And in my blog, I have links to a further discussion in this. There's a whole book you can get. And this idea of suffering in the presence of a loving and powerful God. It's a book called Theodicy of Love. So I'm not going to go into that. My blog has a link to it. It's a great book. But I'll share a little bit of my perspective on this. The Lord was with Joseph, gave Joseph a vision, a dream of one day he was going to be successful and a great leader. And yet in his life, he's been suffering persecution and being betrayed by his closest friends, his family members, betrayed him, sold him to Egypt. As we see in the story, Joseph keeps going down and down and down. So how do we reconcile these two? If the Lord is with us, why do we struggle? And here's a way that I think about this. And let me know later if you find this um, helpful. And by the way, this is an I am facilitating a conversation. I'm starting the dialogue. Uh, if you're watching online, leave comments in the video. Here at church, come and talk to me afterwards. You don't have to agree with me or you can add to what I'm saying, but here's how I look through it, how I think through this. As a father, 
I love it when my children are obedient to me. I love when they're loving towards me. If you've had little children and they come and they hug your leg and they say, I love you, it's like the best thing ever. And as they grow up, when they choose to come to you and say, it's like, I love you, or to call you, or to remind you, or, or to just, you know, it, it, it feels so nice. But I think the reason why we value so much those demonstrations of love is because we are very much aware that our children or people around us in general, or our spouse, or our friends, or our siblings, they don't have to love us. They can be mean to us. They can be rude to us. They can be disobedient. So because they can be so mean and so disobedient, when they choose to love and to obey, it means so much more. Do you follow me so far? So imagine because God has a special plan for Joseph. God now forces his brothers to be kind to him. And God forces everybody to always help Joseph. Do we want life to be that way? Well, maybe for Joseph we want it that way. But let me ask you this. How do you feel when the local government tries to force you to do something? We don't like it very much, right? But yet we turn to God and says, why do you allow people to disobey you? You should just force everybody to obey you. But I don't think God is in that business. If my children did not have the option of disobeying me in one sense, I'm like, oh, that would be great. But in another sense, I would never feel love from my children because they have no other option. So I, I wrestle with this, right? So we see in the story of Joseph, it's this complex image, and I think it, it reflects reality where we have people, someone who is loved by God, and God has a plan for this person, yet people around them are free whether to love him or to betray him, whether to help him or to be mean to him, whether to be merciful to him or to sell him as a slave. God is working through people without limiting their freedom. And it's messy and it's difficult. But just because people are being mean to Joseph, it does not cancel out the fact that the Lord is with Joseph. And God will work through Joseph. And it's messy and it's complicated, but there is that freedom that we want to experience and we want God to allow that. So that means that people around us are free to mistreat us. So how do we handle this? And hopefully we'll get a chance to dive into this as we, as we talk about this topic. We see the complexity of life where God is acting without limiting the freedom Verse 2, again in Genesis 39, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Joseph was successful. Verse 3, it says that his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. This is something that surprised me. Joseph is succeeding. Well, this part didn't surprise me because God caused him to succeed. But God is blessing him because Joseph is actually working hard. It's, it's very difficult for God to bless you in something that you're not doing. But once you start doing something, then God can bless you in that. And here is the challenge, right? We tend to imagine, maybe we don't say it out loud, but we, we tend to imagine a life blessed by God or God being with us as us living a life of ease and perhaps even idleness. We think that if God is with me, then I should be able to just lounge around, do mostly nothing, and have a very pleasant and easy life. In thinking about this, my mind went back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. This is before the fall. The fall takes place in chapter 3. So here is the perfect world that God created. There is no death. There is no suffering. There is no decay. The earth is perfect. And it says, then the Lord God took the man and put him where? In the garden. This is the perfect garden. And God put him there to do what? To tend and to keep it. Was, were Adam and Eve in eternal vacation? No. They had some responsibilities. But how many of you here enjoy gardening? There's quite a few. I've tried. I'm not good at it yet. Things tend to die. But there is something 
that feels good about tending to something else and seeing it grow and flourish and to, I, I've, I've benefited from many of you who have amazing gardens and delicious fruit and vegetables and, and you share them and thank you so much. And that there's, such, there's something that, that pleases us that we find joy in, in cultivating and working. We're not meant to be idle. You see, the curse is that work became burdensome. That came with sin. But work in and of itself is not bad. It's not evil. If you're studying, if you're working, if you're doing good things, there is a blessing in that. Even in the midst of hardships, there is a blessing and a dignity that comes from work well done. Now follow my train of thought here. Joseph has been sold as a slave by his own family members, taken to a foreign land, bought by this Egyptian, what are his options? Joseph has every reason to be angry and destructive. He was betrayed by those closest to him. He was sold. He's in a foreign land. He has every reason to be angry, to be destructive. But it does not mean that that's the best course of action. Would his anger and rebellion against his master, would that restore him to his father's house? Would that make his brothers realize the great evil they had done and come to him and apologize and embrace him again as a brother? The destructive behavior is an option. And it would be understandable for Joseph to behave in a destructive way. But it wouldn't be beneficial to him or to anybody. And this is tricky because I tend to want to focus on the things that are beyond my control. Oh, big pharma. Oh, the government. Oh, they're destroying and whatever. And this is happening in Brazil and the politicians. Oh, and, and then we, we just feel bad and then we just want to numb ourselves and then we don't do anything productive. I think Satan would be very happy with all Christians just being helpless powerless and just numbing themselves and not being a light in the world the world is so evil there's so much pain there's i can't do anything i can't change washington i can't change these big companies i can't ah the world is wicked there's nothing i can do so I'll do nothing but joseph focuses on what he can do he is in control of his attitude and he chooses to work hard and to work well and God blesses him. And God uses Joseph in his strong work ethic to witness to that Egyptian, to his master. Joseph refused to behave in a way that made sense by the world's standards. Joseph begins a, Joseph begins a rebellion. He's rebelling against the script that society gave him. Society wanted to give him a script. Hey, look, you're a slave. You are a victim. You are helpless. Just, just do it you're, as you're told. Do the bare minimum. He doesn't, your master doesn't deserve your hard work. He doesn't deserve your dedication. He doesn't deserve your love. You just be angry and bitter and go through life that way. And Joseph said, well, what if I did my very, very best? Well, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. You're a slave. You're not going to benefit from working hard. Your master doesn't deserve your hard work. Why would you work hard? Why would you bless this man who is part of the oppression against you? Just be rebellious. Be angry. Let the world burn. It makes sense. But he rebels against that. And, and here's how I've been thinking. About. I've been wrestling with this. And, and the best explanation that I have for this is that Joseph was not behaving like a slave. He's not working for his master. Joseph was working for God. His life was worship for God. His master only got to witness Joseph's love for his God. He lived for God. He worked for God. You see the bare minimum that he had to do to not be punished? That's the work of a slave. You do it so that you don't suffer. You do it so that you don't have anything taken away. You do it so that you can, you know, survive. That's the work of a slave. Anything beyond that is the work of a free person. Joseph was living his life as a free 
man, going above and beyond. I think this is what Jesus was talking about when he told them to turn the other cheek or go the second mile. The first mile you go as, you know, servants of the Romans at the time of Jesus. The second mile you go as a free man, a free woman. You're choosing to be kind. You're choosing to be helpful. You're choosing to be a light. You're choosing to be part of the good, not because the other person deserves it, but because of your relationship with God. Joseph's master caught a glimpse of God and realized God is with this man. God is blessing him. Why? Because Joseph was going above and beyond, and suddenly he's starting to see a God that they don't know about. Like, there's, there's something weird here. This, this guy, I imagine all the slaves, and I haven't done their historical research, but I think it's fairly safe to imagine this, that all the slaves just did the minimum. Like, whatever I have to do to not receive a beating, whatever I have to do to not, you know, be in the, in the boss's wrong side. And, and as this is happening, I, I want you to also to keep in mind, and I, and I put a slide in here for this, and I appreciate the mental health seminars we're having because it, it gave me so much to think about. Don't let anybody use this to keep you in an abusive relationship. And I want to clarify here. Joseph did not have options. You have options. You live in a free country. Don't stay in a toxic work environment. Start applying to other places. Look for help. Talk to HR. Don't stay in an abusive relationship. Look for counseling. Talk to someone. Get out of the abusive relationship. Don't be abusive towards somebody else and then quote scripture like Joseph. You just have to submit and do your very best regardless of how little I pay you. No, no, no. I'm not saying this. Joseph was in a special circumstance where he didn't have any other recourses or, op or options. Does that make sense? Every time I start preaching about this, uh, it comes to mind some horrible stories that I've heard about spiritual abuse and people who use the Bible to be abusive towards their wife, towards their children, towards church members, towards... And I want you to always be aware God does not call you to just receive abuse and take it. God calls us to be kind, to be loving, but also to stand up for justice and to be a voice for those who don't have a voice. Just look at the ministry of the prophets. That's what they do. And they end up in jail or in prison. But, so we've got to find that balance here. I'm saying for Joseph, he did not have any other options. He chose to work hard. He behaved as if this was his household, as if it was, he was an entrepreneur and this was his business. He went above and beyond, and his master saw in that, that Joseph, that, that God was working through him and blessing him, and, and he was prospering under that. It's almost like Joseph had an understanding of things that were not really flushed out until the New Testament. But here I see the same God working throughout the Bible. This was already true all the way back in the Old Testament. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph didn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ, but he knew about God, and it's the same character. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. In everything Joseph did, he was worshiping God, even though I imagine it felt like God was a million miles away from him. Yet he chose to behave in a way that was reflecting his relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I want to share a little bit more on this. Oh, here we go. I do have a slide for this. Potiphar did not deserve the quality of the work that Joseph delivered. Joseph worked like he did because he was an act of worship. Sometimes we can excuse our poor behavior on the people who are around us. Let me explain this a little bit further. Well, I do the bare minimum at work because my boss is incompetent. Right? It makes sense. I could blame my boss for my poor performance. I could say, well, I am a... Uh, I, I behave this way towards my spouse because let me tell you what my spouse did. I remember one time I, I was with my dad. I think this was after church, and I was just begging my dad to leave church, but he, as the church pastor, was staying and talking with people, so I'm just standing there. My mom and sister were somewhere else, but I was there, and this man came to talk to my dad. I'm like, oh, another person. I'm like, I mean, I'm going to go eat. And this man came to my dad. I was like, Pastor, let me tell you about my wife, and my wife this, and my wife that, and my wife the I was like, oh, boy. Like, maybe I should move somewhere else. And then my dad turns to this man and says, wow, can you tell me a little bit about your wife's husband? <laughs> and he didn't want to talk about it. It's very easy for us to say, well, I'm this way because, well, look, let me tell you about the people around me. 
Let me tell you about my teacher, my classmates, my neighbors, and that's why I behave this way. Man, if we're going to wait for people to deserve our love and our kindness and our help, she's not going to help anybody. So how about we become loving and kind and patient towards others, not because they did anything to deserve it, but because they need it. Because if every time I hurt, I feel like I have to go around hurting other people so they can feel a little bit of what I've been through. Can you imagine if everybody did that, we would all be suffering all the time. Joseph could have done that, right? Showing up in Egypt, I'm going to be the worst person they've ever seen, the worst slave. And he would have suffered even more, but at least other people suffered as well. That would make sense. But he does the opposite. So I've suffered so much. I don't want others to suffer. And by the way, my boss has nothing to do with what my brothers did. I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to be a part of the good in this world. There's so much pain and suffering in the world. I'm going to be a part of the good. But this person doesn't deserve you to work that hard. Doesn't deserve your kindness. They don't deserve you volunteering, going above and beyond for them. I know, but God calls me to be the light of the world. God calls me to be salt. And I am going to make a difference. There's a lot of suffering in this world. But if where I am, if I can do some good, may it be for the honor and glory of God. A different way of looking at this. People don't deserve your kindness and your love and, and your hard work, the quality of the work that you do. They don't deserve it. Do it for God. Do it because of your relationship with God. This is who you are in a way of reflecting the character of the God that you worship. What if we decided to be more generous and more merciful to those around us, not because they deserve it, but because we also receive blessings that we do not deserve from God. Look at this, verse 4 of Genesis chapter 39. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from that time that he made him overseer uh, of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for whose sake? The Egyptian was blessed for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. He received the blessing because of Joseph's faithfulness. Joseph chose to live from a place of generosity and kindness, desiring to be a part of the good that is in the world. If we can take that example... And regardless of how others mistreat us, we always choose to be kind and to be a part of the good. We'll also keep in mind, remember, like I said, you don't stay in an abusive relationship. You can change jobs. You can look for help. But don't let it make you a bitter person that goes out there hurting others. Does that make sense? It's terrible that we suffer. We should not. It's terrible how others treat us. They should not treat us that way. We should not be treated the way that we are treated. But we choose how we treat those around us. My friends, this is not easy to do. It's a challenge. But I believe it's what God is calling us to do. This is why God could use Joseph in such a mighty way. People around him were blessed for his sake. And you know what's interesting? When I look back on my life, many times I received blessings from people around me. When I was going through college, there were so many times that I received unexpected blessings from people who barely knew me. Whether they were just inviting me home for a Sabbath lunch. By the way, if you're a college student and somebody invites you over and you get to have a home-cooked meal, ah, oh, it's the best. So thank you for those of you who do that for others, just inviting people to your house. When I was... A, I, I was a, a poor graduate student at Andrews, and I was helping at a church, the Papa Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you're ever in Michigan, it's a small church, but it's so worth visiting. Amazing, warm, loving people. I had people that would not only invite us to their homes for, for lunch on Sabbath afternoon, which was great. Um, every now and then, I would find that in that church, there were little mailboxes. Here we have a place with letters so if you haven't sometimes go by there and check sometimes there's something for you but so there's uh, a, a ciphered box there is for my wife and I and every now and then someone would put a grocery card in there and man he would just carry us through the month people didn't know the struggles that we were going through 
as poor graduate students. Some of you know what that's like, but people from the church would just bless us without us ever asking, and it made such a huge difference. So I love being in a position where now I can do that for somebody else. I can put a little something for them. I can choose to be kind and loving at work or towards my children or towards my spouse, especially when they're struggling, or towards my boss. And, you know, just to be a part of the good that is in the world. And I'd like to close with one story. And it's inspired by Joseph's sermon, right? In Genesis 39, verse 3, it says, His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made him all that he did to prosper in his hand. Actually, let me read one more verse, and then I'll tell you the story. Verse 6 of Genesis 39. This is the last verse for this morning. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread that he ate. And then there's this one more verse that really should, this last sentence should be part of the next verse in my mind. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance, but you have to come back next week to find out what happens because of that. <laughs> but I'll close with this story. It's a story that I got to witness, well, a part of it firsthand, and maybe some of you have heard about this. There is a family, a Brazilian family that was missionaries, the De Paiva family. They were over in Palau and they suffered uh, one of the most, I think it was the most brutal crime that's ever happened in the history of that island. Um, the family was brutally murdered and the daughter was left for dead. Melissa De Paiva. I had the privilege of meeting her in my very first church uh, her grandmother was the dean for the girls' dorm, and she was now living with her grandmother. Now, if there's someone that I've ever met that had reasons to be angry with God and bitter and just rebellious and not wanting to do anything, it would be this young lady. Her parents were missionaries in a foreign country going above and beyond to help the locals. And to have that happen to her family. I'm not going to go into any details. You can look up online. There's information. There's, they made a documentary about it recently. Powerful stuff. But I'll share my experience with her. I was a youth pastor at the church. And I was often involved with school events. My wife was a teacher. She had her as a student. And she was a freshman in high school at this point. So a few years had gone by. And this girl is one of the sweetest, nicest people you could ever meet. Top of her class hardworking, dedicated, kind, and loving. And the students around her didn't know who she was, didn't know what had happened. She's just this girl that lives with her grandparents. She could have been just the angriest. And the thing is, if I had met her as an angry, just mean-spirited, I would have said, oh, poor girl. I mean, it, it makes sense. Oh, this is terrible. But she chose, and I don't know how, else, outside of the grace of God and Jesus in her heart, there's no explanation. And she's now married to a pastor. They, uh, she is a nurse. Uh, they are, her, her husband is the pastor of the King Church in Texas. It's like the biggest church in the conference there. And she's just the sweetest person you'll ever meet. Doing her schoolwork, helping her friends, doing all of these things. And it just, it amazes me every time I interact with her. Every time that I see her. Because here is an example. And it shows that this can, this can still happen nowadays. Where people can suffer incredible, unspeakable things. And turn around and be a light in the world. And a blessing for others. My friends, God is calling us to do this. He does not leave us alone. He will work in us and through us to be a blessing for others. But it takes our choice. Joseph had a choice. And he chose to go above and beyond. And God blessed them and caused them to succeed. And then people around him are like, man, God is with this guy. Everything he touches prospers. And, and I'll share something too. Joseph must have been one hardworking man because I haven't seen God cause lazy people to prosper. I'm not saying he doesn't do it. I just haven't seen it. And I'm sure that a lot of the things that happened with Joseph look like luck. Man, this guy is so lucky. I've also noticed people who work hard tend to get lucky more often than people who are just sitting at home. Just saying, we have a choice. And stop blaming other people for your poor behavior. 
Stop blaming others for your laziness. Stop blaming others for you being mean. It's up to us. We have a choice on how we react. Yes, unfortunate things happen, and it's unfair, and it should not have happened. But we have a choice on how we react. We can either be a part of the pain and the suffering and add on to that, or we can choose to be a part of the good. It's not an easy choice, and it's going to be hard. We see Joseph. He's doing everything right. There is something coming. Please come back next week to find out what happens. But we choose at every point, do I want to be a blessing? Do I want to allow God to work through me? It's hard, but I think it's worthwhile. And we can be a part of God's blessings on this earth. We can be Jesus' hand and feet in this world. People will come to know God because you choose to go above and beyond for the benefit of someone who has no way of ever repaying you. But we don't do it for them. We do it for God. And we're just reflecting God's love right back to those who are around us. My friends, in this world of pain and suffering, and I don't see it getting any better. I don't care who's elected. It's going to get worse. But we can be a part of the good. If you're willing to be a part of the good, say, Lord, bad stuff is going to happen this week. Please work through me. I still want to be a part of the good. I want to choose to be loving, to go above and beyond, and to do it for your honor and glory. If you want to give this a try this week, I invite you to stand with me as we close with prayer. I hope you were blessed by today's message. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you or for you, please feel free to contact us. May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.